challenge it is that we have uh, this ability to Guys, last week we concluded uh, uh, where Jesus in, in uh, verse 14 of chapter uh, 13 spoke to his disciples. He said, if, you, if, you, if I, uh, I then the Lord and the teacher wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. And there was a time that Jesus, uh, after the supper, what he did was he took off his robe, he put on, uh, he took off his garments, he wrapped himself in a towel, he grabbed a basin, a basin of water, and he went out around the room, he washed the feet of uh, his disciples, his followers. But Jesus was speaking to them as he does to us today, do as, the, do as I have done. And we finished our study in Colossians 3 where we, we were encouraged to put Christ on. And when he says put Christ on, it's like putting on a garment or a robe. We're cloaked in all his goodness, in all his love, in all of his uh, attitude as a servant. He came as a servant of all. He came not to be served, but to be a servant to all. He came to seek, to save the to seek and save the lost. And this is the, 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 the MO of Jesus. He came to lay his life down for us. He didn't come to be uh, uh, receiving all the accolades of mankind, but he really came to be a servant, a servant to all. But we pick up our study here in John chapter 13, the Gospel of John chapter 13, in verses 16 to 20, we'll read. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak of all of you. I know that the ones I have chosen, but it is in that scripture uh, that might be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, who receives me, whomever I send, uh, receives me, and he who receives me, receives him who sent me. Uh, uh, the key word that I want to zoom in is on, in, on, in uh, verse 18, the word lift, the word lift, uh, the word lift in this voice, or lifted up his heel against me, is used as a metaphor, or is used as a picture or an example of lifting up the foot before kicking. And Jesus is saying that it is somebody here that's going to lift up his foot and he's just going to kick me. It's like kicking me in the gut. It's like an MMA guy like BJ Penn just kicking the stuffing out of you. But this, uh, this expression that's used, kicking, uh, this expression indicates contempt and violence. And when you think of somebody kicking you, hey, that's a violent act because you know that the foot, the, the leg has a lot of strength, a lot of power. And Jesus is saying, hey, somebody who's lifted up their heel against me. And, uh, and, and here it is, he who breaks bread with me is filled with hatred and contempt. And you know, Jesus had just done um, the, the, the Last Supper, they had gone through the Passover, they went through uh, the, the Lord's Supper where they, they broke the bread, they took the cup, and this, he said, do this in remembrance of what I've done for you. And all of these things took place, and now he's saying that there's one in our midst that uh, is going to lift up his foot against me, his heel against me. And he who breaks bread is filled with hatred and contempt, he's saying. And uh, what a turn. Uh, from love and from uh, adoration. And when you think that hey, the disciples had followed Jesus for about three years, and for most of them, hey, they were filled with that love and adoration. Yet here, there in their midst, was one that was filled with hatred and contempt. And when you can kind of think of that word hatred, wow, that's a strong word. Hatred is a strong word to think that, oh, Oh, I hated my dinner. That thing was so lousy. The thing was undercooked, was overcooked, was over seasoned, was under seasoned, whatever it might be. But to say that, yeah, I hate someone with a passion. And that word hatred is such a strong word. But this is the word as described uh, that uh, one who was there in their midst uh, was filled with hatred and contempt for the Lord. Verse 19, he says that, and I'm telling you this in advance. So when it comes to pass, it only confirms to you who I am. And a lot of times Jesus speaks like that. He speaks words, he speaks promises, and, and uh, when they come true, we kind of go, wow. 
uh, uh, this is what is going on. I'm telling you so that you are affirmed in the knowledge that I am the Son of God. It's kind of like the ding on your phone. It, it goes ding. A light goes on. Oh, now I remember. Now I know. Uh, like the Spirit bringing remembrance to our mind. Oh, now I know. Oh, yeah, Jesus said that. And look, it's come to pass. And Jesus has uh, accomplished this in our life. He's brought deliverance from this situation. He's delivered me from my past. He's forgiven me of my sins. And this is what he said. And he says that I have plans for you. Plans for him long ago with perfect faithfulness. And no matter what you go through, God is bringing you to fruition. God is bringing us to completion. God is with us every step of the way. As difficult as it is, He's promised us never to leave us or forsake us. And why is the, the Bible so important? It's because there's so many promises that He's written uh, to us in the Word of God. And at that, at that right time, God brings it to remembrance. At that right time, God says, hey, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In other words, don't let your mind wander back to those old things. Don't let your mind wander back and think that, oh, we had such a good time back then. It wasn't a real good time. It was a real bad time. When you think about it, look where it got me today. It's gotten me all bust up. And, and, and you, you, you kind of say, hey, it's not a good time. And God, God says, take that cap talk, thought, uh, thought captive to the obedience of Christ. For our weapons, our warfare are divinely powerful for the tearing down of strongholds. And a lot of times these strongholds, they're in our heart, they're in our mind. And the enemy has created these strongholds and we built these little fortresses in our hearts and minds. And, and Jesus is saying, hey, uh, uh, the warfare, uh, the weapons our warfare are divinely powerful. It's not like we're going to go out and we're going to beat up the guy. But it's a spiritual battle, guys. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual thing that he wants to deliver us from the bondage or from the from the doubt and the fear that we uh, we have. And uh, you know, we sang uh, we sang a song today that really spoke of it spoke of a time of desperation and doubt and fear and how God brought deliverance. And you know, I don't know about you, but a lot of times, yeah, I go through times of doubt, you know, probably every other thought is a doubtful thought. But sometimes we get fearful, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if the bottom drops off? What if I lose this? What if I lose my job? What happens, you know? But you know, we, it spoke of a time of desperation, of doubt and fear, and yet God is able to do exceedingly beyond what we think or ask. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a great thing to remember. It's a good thing that we worship the Lord. It's a great thing that God is speaking to us. I like that light going off. Ding, oh now, I remember, oh God, I know that you said you're going you know, you to make it happen. You're going to bring it to pass. Verse 21 says, and uh, Jesus had said this, John 13, verse 21. Jesus had said this. He became troubled in his spirit. And he testified and said, truly, truly, I say, to you that one of you will betray me. And we see uh, the word trouble here again is used, this, uh, it's the same word we saw in chapter 11, verse 33, at the death of his friend Lazarus. And it, it speaks of uh, 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 that word trouble, speaks of trouble in your soul and in your spirit. And you know, it's sometimes uh, you can think that, oh, that mosquito is troubling me, it's bothering me, it's buzzing around me. Or you could be at the beach trying to have a picnic or trying to have a quiet time that fly is bo bothering you and trying to bite you and land on you. But you know, he was uh, speaking that in my heart, I am troubled. In my soul, I am troubled. In my spirit, I am troubled. Uh, because he says, if hey, one of you is gonna betray me, one of you is going to betray me. And it was a heart-wrenching or gut-wrenching sorrow, guys, as he announces this to the closest of those who were with him. And these men walked with him, they talked with him, they ministered with him, they went through the difficult battles and attacks of the enemy, of the Jews, uh, people were against them. Uh, but yet, uh, he announces that uh, um, to, to uh, the closest of them, that hey, one of you is going to betray me. Why? Uh, why did these events still yet to come break Jesus' heart? Follow with me in your Bibles, if you can, to Psalm 55. Psalm 55. You see, God, He does all things well. And, you know, even uh, as He strings together in the Word of God, 
all the things that will take place, all the things that will take place, all the things that have taken place, uh, God speaks uh, uh, well into the past, the present, and the future. But Psalm 55, uh, starting in verse 12, he says, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Uh, nor is it one who hates me who has, exalt <coughs> who has exalted himself <coughs> against me. And here the word, uh, the word of God tells us, it was not an enemy. It wasn't one who hated me, but uh, uh, with just cause. You know, it, it wasn't because I deserve to be hated. Or it wasn't one who sought to exalt himself against me. The thought of enemy may be uh, thought of as a personal foe for or one who will show hostility, hostility to me. And that's the idea. He says, hey, it's, it's, it wasn't an enemy. It wasn't one who hated me without cause. It wasn't one who sought to exalt himself against me. But that enemy was one who was a personal foe, who will show hostility to me. And that's the whole idea. Uh, it's not an enemy, uh, but it was one of my familiar companions. He says it right here. Uh, uh, then I could hide myself from him, but it is you, a man of my equal, verse 13, my companion and my familiar friend. He says, uh, 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 we had sweet fellowship together, verse 14. We walked in the house of God in the throng. And he says, here's the heartbreak. I considered you an equal. I treated you as such. We were companions and friends even. We were well, well acquainted and we know each other well. We enjoyed sweet fellowship with one another. We worship together in the house of the Lord. He's saying that if the enemy is not one who was from the outside, but it was somebody who was very familiar to me. It was somebody who was very close to me. It was somebody that was my companion, and we enjoyed the worship. We enjoyed the fellowship of the Lord. And you know, this is how the Lord is feeling that, hey, I spent these three years with, with these guys, and here is one in our midst that is going to betray me. Verse 15 in uh, Psalm 55 says, Let death come deceitfully upon them, and let them go down alive to Sheol, for evil is in their dwelling and in their midst. Uh, is God pleased with the death of the sinner? What do you guys think? Is God pleased with the death of the sinner? No. No, yeah. Okay, great. No way. Ezekiel 33, 11. Uh, the word of God declares, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn back, turn back from his way and live. Can, can you imagine that? Ezekiel says, uh, is appealing to the sinner, turn back, turn back. I have no death. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Think of the guy that, that is the worst, the most heinous guy. You might think of that shooter in Las Vegas who so uh, cowardly and dastardly took so many lives. Uh, you know, just the other day in Las Vegas as he fired thousands of rounds or hundreds of thousands of rounds. I don't know how many bullets he fired and he just mowed the people down. And yet, God, God uh, was God pleased with the death of his sinner? No, he wasn't. No way. He, uh, he would rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. And you know, uh, it's a hard thing because you can say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and you know, uh, so it is. But uh, but uh, given the circumstance, God would have him come to him and say, please forgive me, God, and turn from his way, and then face the consequences of his evil doing. You know, you cannot erase the consequences. You cannot erase the, the things of what, what, uh, what the course or what the, uh, the, the punishment is, but you can have the forgiveness of God. You can have the forgiveness of God. Verse 16 in uh, Psalm 55, he goes on, But as for me, I shall call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Here uh, is where the hope lay for the Lord. It was the hope for David. David was the writer of this song. It should be our hope in all situations, uh, not only during uh, dire circumstances, guys. In all situations, our hope uh, is in God. And that word hope is, again, the anticipation of good things to come. If we're seeking the Lord, if we're following after Him, if we're trying to do it according to His will and to His way, and He's going to make that way for us. And sometimes the road is bump, rough, bump, uh, 
bumpy. Sometimes you know we we hit that uh, that dip, we hit that big bottle in the road, we go bouncing all over the place. And God, yet God is still trying to keep us straight on course, straight on target, straight along, moving along with Him as He takes us from that those rough spots onto those smooth those smooth spots. Sometimes the ride is uh, the ride is rather rough and wild, but you know, with God, you know, He makes that way for us. Verses 17 to 18, evening and morning and at noon, I will complain and murmur. He will hear my voice and he will uh, redeem my soul in peace from the battle which is against me. I love this place, this part, because David is as, as much of a human as he is. He says that e evening, morning and at noon, I will complain and murmur. Wasn't David honest? And you know... <laughs> And sometimes we think that, hey, we think that we're holy, we're so holy, we're not going to complain, we're not going to grumble. And though we might not voice it, and you don't, you don't, you don't want to voice it, you don't want to complain to other people and make them feel down or whatever it is, but sometimes in our hearts, hey, we're complaining, we murmuring, we, we're grumbling, we question God, oh, how come God this, how come God that? Hey, I did my journaling, I'm doing my prayers, you know, I, I, I doing this, I doing that. Not, uh, not, not quite me, but you know, I've heard that expression, you know, and and uh, and and, and uh, I, I gotta confess that sometimes I murmur, I complain, I grumble. How come this? How come that? Or how come? Why, why gotta worry? You know, why gotta do this? Why gotta do that? I try to serve you, God. I try to be good. <laughs> And, and, and you know, there's, there's the realization that only He is good. But you know, even in our complaining, He hears our voice, guys. He redeems us from the turmoil and He brings us uh, to peace as the battle rages. You know, David was one, he was well acquainted with a lot of things. And he did some woos, he did some bad mistakes in his life too. You know, his hand, uh, he sent Uriah the Hittite to the front of the battle. And you know, he kind of pulled his men back and hey, Uriah was killed. And you know why? It was because David was sitting with his wife Bathsheba. And he was trying to cover up all this sin. And you know, it's a big web of deceit that he got himself into. Yet the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. He confessed, he repented, he was he was grieved, and yes, he had he went through a lot of hardship because of his own sinful ways. Even with his, his, his own household, his kids went wild. His kids uh, tried to do this and that, to steal the kingdom from him. His kids, uh, one son raped his half the sister, and you know, a lot of bad things went on. And uh, because David wasn't, you know, uh, ideal, he made mistakes. And you know, in that, you know, I kind of think that, hey, God, God still loved David. He still called him a man after God's own heart. And he says, hey, the, and you, you can kind of say to yourself, hey, there's hope for me then. Because, you know, I made bad mistakes at times. I made some wrong choices. And yet, uh, as I come to God, First John uh, 1 John 1.9 tells us that He is faithful and just to forgive us as we confess our sins to Him. And not that we live in sin, not that we, we want to continue to walk in sin, but we kind of, the word repent is to turn from that sinful way, to turn from that mistake and to press on in the things of the Lord. Not that we can live. Forgiveness doesn't say that we can live in a continual, perpetual state of sin. We're going to turn from that sin. We're going to make it right. We're going to make it porno with the Lord. And we're going to be, you know, right on with Him. And uh, uh, it's only in His righteousness. Uh, I have this old used Bible that I was just uh, thumbing through. And uh, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a neat Bible. It's kind of a... Uh, it was like... It was like a forerun for a certain Bible society. It has lots of good uh, information and study notes in it. But uh, the the lady that owned it was a dear saint from Texas. You know, we bought it online, and you know, it's kind of falling apart now. I was thinking I gotta send it off to get it rebound. But I was just looking and uh, uh, I in one of her notes it said right on the top of the Bible, righteousness is right standing with God. And in other words, for the believer, we got to be standing right with God. We got to be standing, not in our own righteousness, but uh, in the righteousness of, righteousness of Jesus Christ, we're standing upright and we're doing our best. We're not living in sin. We're not, uh, we're not 
just talking the talk and living like hell, you know. I, I knew a dear old guy who was uh, just a uh, confirmed, he was, uh, go, he would go to church on Saturday or Sunday, but throughout the rest of the week, he would kind of live like hell with a guy. <laughs> and he was, he was swearing, cussing, shouting. He was uh, not that pleasant at times, but, um, and he would be in a t-shirt and jeans most of the time during the week, but on Saturday or Sunday before he went to church, he was in nice shoes, nice slacks, a nice aloha shirt. His nine hair, uh, his hair was slicked over real nice. He was all washed up. He was proper and prim to go to church. But throughout the rest of the week, you know, that outward appearance of being right with God, you know, he wasn't kind of living it. He wasn't living it. You know, he was kind of filled with uh, a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, and a lot of it would just be spewed out in foul language and stuff. And, uh, you know, you, you kind of think that, Hey, what's in the heart? You know, the mouth is revealing what's in the heart now. Yeah. And that's why I say, hey, I, I don't want to complain and murmur because I don't want people to think that, oh, Russell, he's not so holy. <laughs> Look what's in his heart. All that complaining, all that murmuring. And yet you got to say, hey, God, thank you. Thank you for working with me. Thank you for allowing me to serve you. And even though, you know, there's times of doubt, there's times of fear, there's times of frustration, there's time of that murmuring and that complaining. And that's the nature of the flesh, that's the nature of the beast. And kind of, we, we want to just beat that thing down, that, that flesh down, and be more like Christ. We need more of the spirit, less of the flesh, guys. Even as complaining, he hears our voice. Turn back to John 13 with me. John 13. We're going to pick up in John 13, verse 22. Jesus had said this, and he became troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one, uh, that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. And it's at, at, time, uh, uh, at an important time of this event, guys, it's good to know that even the closest of Jesus' disciples were at a loss to know. And sometimes, you know, sometimes, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know, and I, I, I really don't know, and sometimes I don't know how to act, because, you know, you're so uh, confounded, or you're so dumbfounded. Jesus' disciples were at a loss to know, and we're in good company if at times we feel that way. In other words, they didn't have a clue as to who Jesus, uh, uh, who the Lord was speaking of. You know, they, 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 they just didn't know. They said, hey, is it I, Lord? Is it I? You know, here's the 12 guys. They were all ministering together. They were living together. They were breaking bread. And yet they were at a loss to know. And many times like us, we, don't, uh, we won't ever be in this particular situation. And yet the same thing applies to us. We are at a loss, quite frankly, at times. We just don't know what's going on. The world is just spinning by. Our heads are spinning. And we just don't know. And, 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 and Jesus is trying to bring us to that place of just simply focusing, sitting before him and trusting in him, resting in him, that he's doing that work. I'm not saying we are so insensitive or spiritually inept that we can't grasp the basic truth or the lesson or revelation from the Lord. Yet at times we're not, we might not be able to process the event or the situation right away. Things are moving fast. Things are just uh, making our heads spin and we just don't know hey, what's going on. And, and there's a time that the ride is going so quickly, it's, it's so rough, that we just gotta trust, hey God, you take the wheel, Lord, you take control because I don't know what's going on. Yet we see in verses 23 to 25, uh, there was one reclining on Jesus' breast, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, and Simon Peter therefore gestured, gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. And he, leaning back thus on Jesus' breast, said to him, Lord, who is it? I love this guy. He says, hey, the, one who, uh, the one who is the beloved. And you know, John calls himself, we call John, John the beloved. But here John, he doesn't mention his name, but he says, hey, the one who, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he's speaking of himself. And uh, John is a trip, but... Uh, here are two of the closest of the disciples to Jesus, John and Peter. 
conferring with one another as they ask the Lord, hey, we need wisdom, we need insight. Uh, and at times, most of the time, we could all use more wisdom and insight, guys. We lack, and therefore we should ask. The Proverbs tell us, without consultation, uh, plans are frustrated, and with many counselors, they succeed uh, or are established. That's uh, Proverbs 15, 22. Grab a prayer partner, come forward, uh, or stick around after the service to get some prayer. They just don't dash off. Uh, uh, too often the standard response or reply is, hey, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Everybody's good. <laughs> how are you, Russell? Oh, I'm good. Oh, the, the world is collapsing. I have all this stuff. I'm climbing those barges, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to lift those loads down there on the construction site. What? Hey, <laughs> I'm burning. Whatever it might be, the response is, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm good, man. <laughs> Liar! <laughs> and you think the world might be collapsing, the standard response is, oh, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> but too often you see the guy over there, they're not so good. You see the guy over there, they're not so good. Who the guy? The guy. You the guy, man. <laughs> Look in the mirror, they're not so good, man. <laughs> There was once a guy, he got into a car wreck and he was in the emergency room and he had, he had this, uh, this doctor, the guy was from Japan, I guess he had a Japanese accent, but the guy had a big, uh, his head went through the window of the car and the doctor's looking and he says, hey, how, how's it doc, how's it? Not bad. The doctor said, oh, not too good looking though. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, what a thing to say. That's not such good bedside man as not too good looking though. What that mean? <laughs> and, and, and that's what the Lord is looking at us at times. Hey, not so good looking. Huh? Yeah. And oftentimes, as a matter of fact, it's the word of God which, uh, which brings counsel. It's the Word of God which brings strong counsel and wisdom. And I love it that we can pray the Word of God too, guys. You know, we can pray the prayers of the Bible. Yesterday, one of the guys, uh, he, he uh, opened to Psalms during the prayer meeting. And he, he sang the whole Psalm. And I said, well, that's, that's spiritual, you know. And uh, he sang the Psalm. And I said, hey, we can pray this. We can sing the Psalms. We can pray the Word of God. We can say, hey, Lord. Your, 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 your light is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And please shine, you know, during this time that I'm going through darkness, something like that, you know. Um, and, and it's a good time, but grab a prayer partner, pray. And, you know, uh, ask the guys, you know, if you're not on the God Squad, it's a good time to pray. You know, we pray for one another. We have a prayer partner for a month. And we might not be going, know exactly what's going on with that person. But throughout the month, we can be praying for them. And, you know, so often, you know, what I find out is, God, you're so funny because the guy was struggling through the, with this or that. And you didn't know it, but you were just praying. And God knows. And then after the fact, it comes out that, hey, I was going through this. I was going through that. Or I was really, you know, struggling in this situation. And yeah, you, you kind of think that, hey, God, you, you're so perfect. You're so um, ideal. You're so ironic. I hope all the guys who get my name every month pray the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Verses 26 and 27 of John 14, John 13. And after the morsel, Jesus entered into him. Uh, it's after, uh, after the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus therefore said to him, what you do, do quickly. Oh, 26, I'm sorry. Jesus therefore answered, uh, that is the one whom I shall dip this morsel, give it to him. So when he dipped the morsel, he took it, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after that morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus therefore said to him, what you do, do quickly. Verse 27, guys, uses an interesting word, and the word is entered. The word is entered. Or Satan entered into Judas. Herein we find the question, can, uh, can uh, Christians be demon-possessed? And you know, you, you, you've heard that thing go on, that question. Can Christians be demon-possessed? Now, whether Judas was a Christian or not, whether he was a true believer, we don't know that. We don't know that if he was just a hang-around or if he had really asked, 
Jesus to come into his heart. He might have been a poser. Everything he said, he did, he looked right, but in his heart was filled uh, with many thoughts of bad things, you know. And uh, uh, he might have been just one hanging around for, to see whatever was uh, whatever he could get out of this deal. That might have been it. But herein we find that question, can Christians be demon-possessed? And whether Christian, uh, Judas was a Christian or not, guys, the word entered has significant meaning of taking control. That word entered means to take control. Uh, now, it would have been impossible for Satan to take control of Judas if he had not willingly submitted himself to Satan. In other words, he says, hey, I submit to you, Satan. Here, the word will, or is it, the, is it the Lord's will, is it God's will, or is it my will be done? Uh, with Judas, it was his will to submit to Satan, his choice to surrender, to submit to Satan. Remember um, Israel, he wrestled with God and the angel of God, and the angel of God put him in a, in a, in a, in a, in a grip. And sometimes, you know, God is wrestling with us, or we're wrestling with God, or we're wrestling against God. And sometimes God puts us in a submission hole to where hey, we tap out, we say, God, I give up, I surrender to you, I surrender my will. And sometimes that strength, that, 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 that hole, that submission hole, we put that submission hole on ourselves. We get into situations that it's impossible for us to get our way out. We, cannot, we try to think our way, we try to wiggle our way, we try to angle our way out, and we're just not getting out. And only then, and only then, after we've tried everything in our own power, in our own wisdom, in our own strength, only then we say, hey God, can you help me get out of this situation? Forgive me, God, because I really messed things up. Forgive me, Lord, because I'm paying the penalty for my sin now, but I'm just trusting in you that you're going to work everything out for the good, for your glory, and, and, and you're going to help me out through this thing. And sometimes, you know, whatever you go through, sometimes it might not be pleasant. Sometimes, uh, Sometimes God's will is that, hey, you pay the penalty for your conse the consequences for your penalty and so on and so forth. Sometimes you pay the consequences of your sin and then God seems to work everything out to transition smoothly. Sometimes we've seen that my records got burned in a fire at the courthouse and, you know, they, they, uh, they dropped the charges against me. Very, very few, very rare, but, you know, we've heard that happen. <coughs> Sometimes God, guys, uh, they, they, for their penalty, they, they lose a lot, they lose everything. Yet, uh, uh, sometimes uh, in that, they come to that place of surrender to the Lord. Lord, I tap out to you. Lord, I surrender to you. Because I'm, I'm in a place, I put myself in a place that I just can't get out. Only you can help me. And that's, that's what uh, uh, says, hey God, not my will, but your will be done. Here, see, uh, Satan entered into Judas's heart because he willingly submitted. He didn't say, hey Lord, I submit to you, but he said, hey Satan, I submit to you and have your way with me. God's, Mark's gospel puts all this into a nutshell, guys, a thumbnail sketch of what went on. If you want to follow along and flip back backwards to Mark's gospel, All these guys have a different, uh, a little different view from where they're at uh, of what went on. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Mark 14 verses 1 to 2 says, Now the Passover and the unleavened bread was two days off. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking out a season by stealth, speaking of Jesus, and to kill him. Uh, for they were saying, <coughs> not during the festival, lest there be a riot of the people. In John 13, we find Jesus and his disciples celebrating the Last Supper. Here the events coincide with one another. And this timeline uh, we find in Mark. The Passover celebration was at hand, guys. The religious leaders were seeking to put to Jesus, Jesus to death. And we spoke all about the religious guys. These were supposed to be the religious leaders, the holy guys, and so on. Yet they had murder in their hearts. 
And uh, verses 3 to 9 tells us, we, we move along quickly, guys. He was sitting at the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. No, he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper. Reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard. Nard, she broke the vial and poured it over his head. And some were indignantly remarking, why, uh, to one another, why is this perfume being wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. Uh, and Jesus said, let her alone for why do you bother her? She has done a good deed for me. For the poor you always have with you and whenever you wish you can do with uh, them good. But you do not always have me. She has done what she has done. Uh, and she has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the, gospel, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that also which this woman uh, uh, has done shall be spoken of in memory of her. It was probably Judas that tried to stir up the brothers as he protested uh, of Mary's extravagant gift to the Lord with the precious anointing oil. Jesus in this prompt rebuke of Judas didn't hold back as he soundly corrected Judas, probably in front of everybody, guys, you know. Judas was thinking that, hey, if he sold that, that perfume, he could kill for some of that money. And, you know, in his heart was uh, unpure motives. In his heart was saying, hey, we're not giving this money to the poor or those who need help. But he says, hey, I can make some profit out of this, you know. Uh, verses 10 and 11 of Mark 14. And Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priest in order to betray him uh, to them. And they were glad when they had heard this and, and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at the opportune time. Now during the years of Jesus' public ministry, guys, Judas is always mentioned. And, uh, f and for this time, Judas was identified with the Lord. Now he sought to be aligned with Jesus' adversaries. This was a 180 degree turn. In other words, these guys were always the opposite of the religious leaders. Here Jesus was saying, hey, you can have a, relig a relationship with the true and the living God. The religious leader says, no, you gotta do it by a list of do's and don'ts. You gotta do it our way. Judas holding his office, uh, but what would possess him to do this? What would, why would Judas turn from following the Lord to, fo to going against him? We may ask this. And, Judas holding his office or position of responsibility was probably looked up by others as a wise man with good administrative skills, with good management skills, business talents, and so on. He was probably gifted with the ability of administration and, and, and of government, but he at one time sought to help Jesus in the ministry using his gift, thinking or believing that as Jesus gained more followers, power, and money, Judas himself would be able to profit in power and wealth. Could it be that G Judas was all, uh, just thinking along the lines that yes, Jesus grows more powerful and more wealthy, yeah, I'm gonna share in that power, I'm gonna share in that wealth. It's hard to believe that there are those still today who see Jesus as a means of gain, of power and influence or financial enrichment. Peter in the first letter encourages the church leader to shepherd church leaders or church elders to shepherd the flock with eagerness and not for sordid gain. In other words, hey, don't just uh, be in this thing of the church. Don't be playing church because you're trying to make money. You're trying to fill your pockets. Hey, not so. But he says, do it. Uh, do it with eagerness. You know, do it with eagerness for the love of Jesus Christ, for the love of the people, for the love of God. Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, for what is it if a man gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? In other words, what if you gain the whole world but you, you lost your soul in eternity uh, away from the Lord? And this is where we find Judas, ambition, greed, selfishness, puts a man on a moral slide to betrayal and the sell-off of former friends. In other words, eh, I'm gonna crucify you, Jesus, because eh, I, I, want, I want what I want. Judas had been ambitious to a fault, even uh, he gave way to selfishness. A passion for power and money drove him, unlike the Lord's passion. You know, we talk about at the, the Holy Week, the week of 
Easter, the, the week of passion, the Lord's passion. You know what the Lord's, pa what the Lord's passion was? It was for you and me. The Lord's passion says, yeah, I gladly give my life, I gladly lay my life down for you, for you, for you, and for me. You know, I gladly, that's my passion. It's not that I'm after the kingship or the crowns or the power, but my passion is, is you, the people, the, the men and women of God. Jesus' plan of redemption disappointed Judas, guys. Oh man, I, I won't have the big political appointment. You know, if you campaign for somebody, if you campaign for governor, and, you, uh, and, and, and you're a big helper, you're a big giver of your time and your talent and your donations and all this and that, maybe I'm gonna get appointed a high political position. So you bank on that, oh, I'm gonna be chief of staff, I'm gonna be the administrator of the, the, the finances, whatever it might be. Uh, I'm not gonna have that big political appointment. I'm not gonna have clout on the finance committee or Israel's chairmanship. He had big plans for himself, see Judas. And sometimes our plans, man's plans are not God's plans. And, and Judas had plans that were contrary to what God's plans were. This turned him to, to disappointment, anger, then bitterness, and seeking some form of reparation. Hey, I want payback. I gotta get something out of this. I gotta get some money. You know, if you sold that perfume for 300 denarii, that was like a whole year's wages just about. That was a lot of money. So he said, hey, I could have profited from that. But look, we wasted all this perfume on Jesus. What do you think Jesus and, uh, was Jesus' thoughts and feelings? The Lord declared in Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, neither is ear so dull that it cannot hear. God never gives up. He's always listening. His ear is attuned to the cry of the penitent, the one whose heart is sorrowful. He said, Hey, Lord, I know I blew it. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, forgive me. You know, he's always listening. We, we close today uh, uh, in John 13. I'm lying, actually. We're not closing in John 13, because we're going to close in 1 Corinthians. But in John 13, we're going to just finish up that portion of Scripture, verses 27 to 30. After the morsel of Satan entered into him, Jesus therefore said, What you do, do quickly. Now no one reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, Jesus was saying to him, Buy these things uh, we have need of for the feast, or else uh, that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. And Judas was one who was kind of moving around in the shadows and the darkness and you know, we talked about the power of darkness and the power of the night, and um, guys, I want to say this: that all things were in motion, God's plans and God's purposes for the redemption of mankind were proceeding with the intent that Jesus would be offered up on the cross for the sins of the world, for you and I. And as the result of Judas' betrayal, the larger picture included God's working on our behalf, as well as Judas's, guys. One last scripture reference, 1 Corinthians 4 to 8, 13, 4 to 8. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant. Do you think that uh, the patience that was shown towards us, I believe that Jesus showed that same patience towards Judas. His love was long-suffering, his love was kind, his love was not arrogant towards Jesus. He was not unbecoming, verse 5 says, it does not seek his own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. You know, Jesus could have said, hey man, you did this bad to me, a payback is a blank, payback is a bleep. You know what, you know what I, that the world's terminology is, payback is, is tough toenails, man. <laughs> Payback is not good, but Jesus didn't say that. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered, nor does it re result in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
love never fails. When I think about Judas, this is the thought that I have. That in, 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 in the love of Jesus Christ, Jesus bore all things with, uh, with Judas. He believed that Judas had within him the propensity to turn away, to repent from his sinful ways and turn back to him. He believed that uh, in his heart, and I love this, a love hopes all things. Can you, can, you, uh, can you agree with me on that? Sometimes when the situation seems hopeless, when you, when you look at that person, oh, it's hopeless, it's a lost cause. And you think of what, oh, in the love of Jesus Christ, we can hope the very best for that person. We can believe the very best for that person. We can endure with that person because Jesus is enduring with him. You know, don't give up the hope, guys, because God hasn't given up the hope. Don't, don't uh, not believe all things. Don't have no hope. Don't have no patience because God has lots of patience. God is long-suffering. He suffered long with us, and he still suffers along with us. And love never fails. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Let's pray. 